Breaking the Stress Cycle from Childhood to Adulthood with Dr. Daniel P. Keating, University of Michigan psychology professor. So let me just... um Let me just start with a little bit of an anecdote that I think many of you would probably be able to uh, relate to, uh, to try to just kind of get us in the the mood for stress. Um, So um, imagine this scenario, and this is not terribly different from some mornings um, at my house a little while back. Um, It's important to get the kids to school and preschool on time because this particular morning there's a very early work meeting that dad has to get to. So everything has been prepared the night before. Um, I'm resisting the th- urge to walk, so I'll, I'll try to do that. Uh, so, so everything's been laid out, you know, sort of got up a little extra early because it's really important to get to this particular meeting. Getting just about ready to go out the door and, honey, where are your shoes? They're not, they're not on your feet. Where are your shoes? I don't know. Well, but I put them out for you. They were right there. Where, where exactly are, are, are your shoes? Well, they aren't there now. Well, I see that. I can see there are no shoes there. Um, to the brother, uh, have you seen her shoes anywhere at all? Uh, yeah. Where, uh, where, where did you see them? Uh, when we were playing with them. And when was that? Well, that was, that was Miss Morning. So do you know where they might be now? Uh, any possibility that you, that you would, uh, that you would uh, know that? No, I, I don't really know. And then a little more sternly, well, look, we've got to get out of the house. I've got this meeting. I've got to get to this meeting. I don't want any joking around. Where, could you please just tell me where those, those shoes are? Um, okay, hopefully many of you have, exper- well not hopefully, many of you have probably experienced that sort of thing, and I would imagine that you can begin to feel, if you can get into the situation, you begin to feel the stress rising. I can't leave the kids here, they've got to come with me, but I've got to get out the door, uh, so how, you know, sort of how am I going to deal with this? So, so switch over now to the kind of internal dialogue. Um, that, that, uh, that might be happening. And this might just be my internal do- dialogue. Maybe I'm being too self-disclosing, but I suspect it's not just me. Um, I wonder if a little yelling might help at this point to kind of move us along and get out the door. A little, just a mild screaming can kind of <laughs> propel us out the door. Maybe a little gentle swipe on the bum would be a way to kind of get us moving to get, get going. No, no, that would be wrong. No, 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 that would be wrong. I can't, I can't do that. That would be a, sending a very bad message. We all know that that's a bad thing to do. Uh, I'm not going to do that. And, and, and it probably wouldn't help. And the devil on the shoulder says, well, it might help you a little bit. I mean, you know, you could kind of get it out a little bit. So in anyway, what, what I think that what we're um, uh, uh, talking about here is kind of that in this homespun example, that's not terribly serious, but you can feel how the stress would be rising. And as that's happening, you're getting a physiological response, right? You're getting, it's not just, oh, I'm feeling emotions, you are. It's not just, oh, I've got a cognitive plan that I can't execute. Yes, that's true too. But on the other hand, what's also going on is that a part of our body is kicking in the HPA, Uh, axis, which essentially has a number of different functions, but one of the key functions is to produce cortisol. Stress response is a complex response, but one of the key elements is the release of cortisol. And cortisol is a very important one for us uh, in a whole host of ways. Uh, One of the things is it allows us to deal with uh, threat situations, dangerous situations, toddlers with no shoes situations. It activates us, it gets us more energy. It it, it helps what's going along. And that ability to kind of use that system efficiently in order to get done the stuff that we need to get done is absolutely crucial for us. It's it's biologically crucial. It's evolution uh, has canalized it. That is, you have a very similar system in virtually all mammals and beyond. Uh, it's, there is a system that says, hey, you got to get up and do something, right? You've got to deal with something that's out there in the world. Um, and not dealing with it, obviously, in other situations could be particularly um, problematic. One of the main foci of what I'd like to talk about uh, tonight is the notion not of stress regulation, really, but its flip side of stress dysregulation. 
or SDR for short. But stress dysregulation means that for whatever reasons you have difficulty, an individual will have difficulty, dealing with that stressful situation. They cannot, in a sense, focus the effort and energy that's produced by this stress response to get something done, after which they then have their system goes back to a more baseline or calmer or more chilling out situation, right? So in a sense, you can think of it as the stress response is upregulating, right, in order to get you activated. But once you've dealt with the situ once you've dealt with the situation, you want to be able to downregulate and go back to a kind of a baseline thing. There are a whole we'll talk about why that's so critically important. In the example that I've talked about is that if you cannot do that, you might in fact continue to propel yourself towards yelling or even hitting. And so one of the things you might do is act out in that situation if you cannot regulate the circumstances about that, that are going on there. So the focus is going to be on kind of stress dysregulation, uh, talking about what is it, right? And we'll talk about it in more serious situations than getting to school or work on time. Uh, there are a variety of things that make life extremely stressful. I'll talk about that a bit more detail uh, going forward. Um, and it may differ across uh, different individuals in different circumstances. If you are in a um, economically disadvantaged, uh, low uh, socioeconomic status, uh, your super stress might come from uh, the inability to know where the resources that you need are going to come from as severe as, say, homelessness, uh, or food insecurity, or other sorts of things. Those are tremendous external stressors that anybody might have considerable difficulty dealing with. But we often don't think about the fact that, of course, at higher levels of SES, there are other stressors. We might worry about the fact, and not to be too, again, self-disclosing, is our kid going to get into the school they want to go to for college? Are they going to have the difficulties, or is it going to be smooth sailing? What about going into the future? Uh, we all know that inequality is rising and social mobility is declining. And so what about our kids? Even if we feel reasonably comfortably well off uh, in that higher SES uh, perch, it doesn't necessarily mean that our kids are going to be do that. We worry about them. Or we might worry ourselves about sliding down. I mean, you know, the Great Recession wasn't that far ago and a lot of people uh, went underwater uh, financially at that particular point in time. That's pretty stressful. You might get that much closer to sliding down in terms of social inequality. So the, 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 the what is it can affect anyone. All right, we'll talk a little bit more about that. What are the consequences? I'm going to emphasize the fact that indeed this stress dysregulation, uh, whether it comes from excess stresses out there in the world that we don't have, um, that we're not able to deal with, or to some extent internally because our stress response system is not as tuned up or well regulated as, as it could be, and that I will argue is on the rise, that those two things can create circumstances where we have, going back to the HPA axis, we've got a lot of excess cortisol floating around in our body over long periods of time. One of the things that we know very well from epidemiology uh, and public health studies uh, of, of co longitudinal cohorts, cohorts that have followed across time, even now from prenatal uh, on into adulthood, that those circumstances can create situations that are uh, have excess cortisol in a way that creates many problems of behavior, that creates many problems of health going into adulthood. I'll talk about that a little bit. One of the things, though, honoring the title here that I'd like to make sure to get to with plenty of time, how can we break the cycle? What do we, uh, if we identify what the cycle is, and I would argue that that's important to understand where this stress cycle is coming from that we're all experiencing, what can we do about it? And I'll make sure that we have enough time to talk about what can I do about it for myself or my family or colleagues at work or friends, what are the individual kinds of things that are possible to do, but then societally, why are we experiencing higher levels of stress? And I will argue that we, in fact, clearly are uh, experiencing higher levels of stress. So 
Uh, here's the plug for the, for my book. Um, I'm not going to go into it. This is not going to be a data-driven talk uh, because. Um, you know, a lot of data's in there, and, and if, if you'd like that, I think it's a good read, but you know, I wrote it, so I guess I would. Uh, but I think that the point is, is that a lot of the concepts are quite more straightforward than the data allow us to see. So if we get lost in the data, sometimes we can uh, miss out um, and not see the forest for the trees. Uh, so I'm happy uh, in discussion to talk about any of these things. I uh, have incorporated a lot of research in, in, into this, I hope in, in comprehensible ways, but not a, not a, you know a great deal of it is not mine. I rely on colleagues' work. Some of it's mine, uh, some of it's lightly mine, some of it's more deeply mine. But a great deal of it is from others. Um, so I will not take the time to go through the data argument here. But I'm happy to address that uh, at any point um, in the discussion. Okay. All right. So I want to talk first, set the stage here a little bit more uh, dramatically, um, uh, and that is that we are experiencing, and uh, I think the evidence is pretty uh, clear cut on this, a pretty severe stress epidemic in the US, and it has been growing for at least three or maybe a bit more decades. And there are three kinds of things that we would look at to do that. Um, the first is that the data from the CDC, the Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, uh, if you look at the many things that are uh, clearly identified as diseases or disorders to which uh, uh, excess stress is a contributor, the reason why uh, we might either have them in the first place or have them exacerbated uh, or manifested more strongly, um, there are a variety of those sorts of things. And essentially all of them, and anybody can go back and look at this, right? I mean, you can set whatever dates you want and look in the CDC data. But if you look at things that we all probably pretty much know about, we look at things like obesity or metabolic disorders or sleep disorders or cardiovascular disorders, what we can see is that those are on the rise. Not not always mortality, we know how to save lives if you have a heart attack, but it's whether you have the condition uh, or not. Those have been showing substantial increases over a 30 plus year period. Uh, for many of these up there in the 20, 25% range, uh, which is certainly not trivial. Um, a second one is population surveys, uh, where we do good, where there have been good representative population surveys, that is that not just catch as catch can, but where we actually have good data, um, asking people, how stressed do you feel? Do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel uh, distressed? Do you feel anxious, right? Um, those have been going up substantially somewhat similar order of magnitude to the diseases and disorders. And another uh, piece of evidence uh, is uh, comes from a study that was uh, th that has just come out fairly recently, where uh, in a national survey that's followed uh, people in the U.S. over a long period of time, that it's called NHANES, where actual physiological indicators, uh, biological um, uh, measures, were taken on individuals, and they've gone back and analyzed that, and so you can identify. We know enough about the stress cycle and how it contributes to health that you can identify a number of the things that are in fact. Uh, uh, contributors to stress. This is before you show any of the disorders or diseases. This is just what are you carrying around as a stress load in your body, right? The stress load in your body, you have indicators uh, in the heart um, uh, functioning, things like cholesterol and whatnot, um, uh, things that have to do with kidney function, liver function, uh, and so forth, that are known to be uh, sort of uh, uh, downstream consequences of excess stress. And what we find in, those, in, this, in these studies, again, same uh, rough time frames, late 70s to uh, early 2000s, what we see is that, that those indicators have gone up across the board for the whole population, significantly so. So we're carrying around more of those dangerous physiological stress responses in our bodies. Um, another piece that I'll just uh, mention and but put a pin in it for later discussion is that that increase has been true across the population, but it's much more dramatically true for individuals who are at low SES, uh, a little less than that for middle SES, but still there for individuals even at the highest levels of SES. So it's not just, you know, if we just had the surveys of self-report, you could say, well, people are just whiners, you know, we've all turned into snowflakes, we just complain all the time, and yada, yada, yada. Um, I, and I don't think that's true, because otherwise we wouldn't see the physiological uh, consequences that we're seeing here at a population level. So. 
I would suggest that there is something uh, pretty significant going on. So why? Why should this be happening? What are the kinds of things that we're uh, seeing that trigger these kinds of stress? Uh, and why is it going up on all of those indicators? How we say that we feel, uh, what our body is carrying around, and how it gets expressed in disorders or diseases uh, uh, that we get. Um, well, if we think about what are the three big psychological reasons why we might have a stress response, right? sometimes functional, but in this case, we're talking about ones that are dysfunctional or dysregulated. Obviously, fear, right? I mean, this is, this is a big motivator for our HPA axis, right? If, you know, if a tiger jumps out of the bush, you were pre-programmed to run as fast as you could, unless you thought you could take it on. So you could do fight or flight, but with a tiger, probably flight's a better choice. And, but, but nevertheless, it's to gear you up to deal with something that's a threat, that's danger, that's a difficulty. Another one is uncertainty. We don't know what the future will hold. That can be uh, anxious making. It can be worrisome. It can make us feel quite upset, which then triggers that stress response. There's not even necessarily a tiger behind the bush. We worry that there might be uh, a tiger around the next bush or whatever uh, format you want to talk about, whatever kind of narrative you want to put together. But this uncertainty about the future, about what's going to happen, can trigger it as well. This is our head making our stress system respond. This is not a real physical thing that happened to us, right? This is, oh, I'm worried that this thing might happen to us, but your stress system doesn't know the difference. Once it's triggered, it's triggered. It's off and running. And if your stress system is dysregulated, for reasons I'll talk about later on, that means that you're gonna have a heck of a hard time bringing it back down to baseline, which then is gonna have a many of those negative consequences that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Um, so during the same period of this 35 to 40 year um, uh, stretch of time uh, that, I, that I was referring to, what else has been going on? Why should it be going up? And why should it be going up differently for lower and higher SES? Well, um, it, 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 it's probably fairly obvious, but I'll state the obvious anyway. One, we all know that inequality has been rising quite sharply over this period of time. Both economic inequality, inequality in income, inequality in wealth, but also social inequality, the differences in education levels between haves and have-nots, differences in various kinds of developmental outcomes for haves and have-nots. So it's not just economic inequality, but it is also social inequality, and clearly those are going to be linked uh, in important kinds of ways. We also know that social mobility has been going down. If you are in the have group, the odds are that you have a pretty good shot at maintaining that if you're born into it. If you're born into the have-not group, your odds are pretty low of being able to move up. And that has been getting worse uh, over this same period of time. I already mentioned lower SES, often these are worries about direct resources, right? Am I going to have enough to eat? Am I going to have a place to live? Uh, or are my kids in danger in the neighborhood that we're living in? All of those are obvious stressors of a significant level. At higher SES, uh, we could worry about sliding, as I mentioned. We might be sliding down because of the steepness of inequality. We, the sliding part is much worse if it's a very steep slope, right? If the difference between the high and the low is big, sliding has much more negative consequences. And if we start pulling away our social safety net, the sliding has even worse consequences. Even if it doesn't happen to us, we worry about it happening to us, right? Um, and the, uh, uh, we worry about our f the, f the, pro the uh, future prospects for our children, right? I, oh, I'm sorry, I, I left out lack of control. That's the third big reason, right? These are things that are going on we feel like we don't have any control over, right? We don't feel like we can, in fact, manage it. If we felt like we had control over it, that's a good stress reducer. We act on that ability to control things. The other thing, as some of you may have seen, uh, not the most recent uh, Sunday, but the one before New York Times Magazine had a big uh, spread on teen anxiety, right? Um, and it's pretty clear from a variety of, of sources that, that, that for teens, anxiety is going up as well for a number of the reasons that, that we've already kind of alluded to. All right. So <clears throat> <clears throat> let's try to get a grip on what we mean by stress just a little bit more deeply. Um, emphasis here is we need our stress systems. They are survival necessities. We couldn't function without them. It is in addition to 
uh, energizing and activating us to deal with threats and dangers and cope with things that, that have to be coped with. It's also, uh, there's a daily rhythm, right? It's what wakes you up in the morning and gets you going in the morning. And if it doesn't go down enough at night, you can't get to sleep, right? And so there's this cortisol rhythm there's a diurnal rhythm I won't go into, a daily rhythm I won't go into in detail, but there's, that's another big function of the HPA uh, axis uh, and the cortisol stuff. So we have to have it, right? It gets us up going out and doing what we need to, to do, right? But this overstress or high anxiety, feeling overwhelmed, feeling distressed, has two related major sources. The one is that the actual stress load is too high, right? We just can't cope with it. It's too much to deal with, right? Um, it's maybe easier to see for individuals who are in economically uh, difficult circumstances, uh, where am I gonna sleep? How do I feed my kids, et cetera, et cetera. It's obvious that's a huge stress load that, that, that sort of no amount of, of uh, sort of thinking it through is gonna take that stress away, right? So there's a, it could be that the stress load is higher even and challenges even a best regulated um, stress system. Um, but for many others, um, and in increasing numbers I would suggest, although the population data we don't have at this point because we've only begun to study how to get at that, but many individuals will have a situation where their system is already out of whack. Their HPA axis is malfunctioning. The one that the book focuses on because it's been the most studied, uh, it has the best animal as well as human data, uh, is in the stress response system specifically, and it specifically deals um, with what with a feedback loop. Don't want to go into the into the into the physiology in much detail here, but basically what we have is a mechanism that, when we get stressed. Then we have a response, adrenaline first, and then cortisol. The cortisol gets us out there and does all those good things that allows us to deal with threats and so forth. Once it's done, right, once we've dealt with whatever it is that we're supposed, that we understand that we're trying to deal with, that excess cortisol is floating in the system and it feeds back to the hypothalamus, part of the brain, and it says, okay, good, cool, enough, stand down, downregulate, everything's cool, just relax. The particular aspect of that that gets, uh, and I'll talk about it now, that can get under the skin, is that, that the, one of the key genes that makes that happen, that makes that feedback to stand down, has been what's known as methylated epigenetically. What it means is that that has, in a sense, for all intents and purposes, gone offline. If you think about it as you go to turn off the faucet and the faucet's broken and you can't stop the stream of water coming out, right? That's kind of what we're talking about here. That's, the, that's an analogy for what we're talking about here. And so what happens then, even a minor eruption gets the system going, but then you can't get it back down, right? What that means, of course, is that you have all that excess cortisol floating around, um, which then has some of the consequences I'll talk about uh, in a moment. So the point that I want to make here is that this stress cycle can become a vicious cycle that overstress places a burden on the next generation because it is the stress of the parents in the prenatal period and in early infancy, roughly first year of life, I mean, these are not hard and fast, but that causes that change that makes that individual very uh, experience the burden of not being able to very well regulate that stress system. That, and of course, what happens is that that becomes something that can get passed along in terms of how they are able to parent because they're stressed out. I'll talk about that in some detail. And there may be a direct biological inheritance mechanism as well I'll mention in a moment. Okay, so let's talk about the cycle um, because I think we need to understand how it works in order to be able to uh, figure out how to break it. And the argument that I wanna make here is that this is a, this is a vicious cycle, it can become a virtuous cycle, we'll talk about that, but at the moment, I think it's clearly functioning as a vicious cycle. Um, and so we need to think about how do we break the cycle at any of these various points. So uh, we, can talk, <clears throat> we can talk about how do we, uh, um, uh, where do we can really, since it's a circle, we can start anywhere. I'll start at the top. Where we start with an early life adversity, early life stress, I'll talk about that in a moment. By early life, I mean very early life, can happen in the womb, can happen uh, early in infancy. But this high level of stress is experienced um, by the fetus or by the infant. That leads to what we talk about as biological embedding, 
There are two mechanisms, the epigenetic one I'll talk about a bit more, and the brain directly. That creates a circumstance where the system is, uh, has a bunch of effects from early life adversity. The one that I focused on is on the stress system. Um, and then you may be wondering, well, can't we get rid of it? So I'll talk about that a little later on. Uh, it, so far as we know, you can't directly get rid of it after about year one or two. You can work around it, mitigate it, and I'll talk about how that happens later on. Um, that, um, that, being, that having that biology then leads to a variety of things that I will talk about as stress dysregulation, right? Shows up in behavior, shows up in, in feelings and emotions, shows up in health eventually, right? Uh, and this has a lifelong impact on developmental health. Obviously these, I've got it set up as a vicious cycle, so all these are negative, right? High adversity leads to the embedding of the stress system in a dysregulated fashion, which leads to various kinds of developmental health problems, impacts development, impacts health. Um, and that then leads to a social inequality because you're more likely to experience early life adversity at lower SES levels and at middle compared to higher. Um, and that then also at a population level raises the overall amount of, of population stress and contributes to the stress epidemic. Um, and then that in turn makes stress contagion more possible. More people are out there not regulating their stress very well through no fault of their own in many cases. Their system is just firing off and they can't do much to stop it. That creates an overall population situation where we've got a lot of stressed out folks who have trouble regulating it, which then of course is gonna to contribute to this early life adversity. Okay, so that's the vicious cycle. I won't go into detail. You can see why I left a lot of data out because each of these has you know, tomes. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's an important kind of thing, I think, to help us understand how this works. So the first thing I want to point out is here's some of the, the I'm not going to go through the data, some of the most robust data that we have in health sciences and social sciences is the link between this early life adversity and stress and the lifelong harm to developmental health, right? It causes problems that are or is, is strongly associated and implicated and in longitudinal studies we get close to causality that essentially means that you're not uh, you're going to experience more problems during development. You're going to experience more emotional difficulties. You're going to experience relationship difficulties. You're probably going to experience learning difficulties. And as soon as you get old enough to experience health problems, they're going to crop up more frequently as well. Adolescence will show self-reported general health is lower uh, in, in, uh, for individuals who have had early life adversity and stress. Then as you go forward and our bodies begin to do what they do, they wear away and wear down. It happens faster uh, for individuals who have a high dose of early life adversity. And so you wind up showing uh, a lot of the other kinds of, uh, a, a lot of health issues across many different systems, not one, but many different systems. Now at this point, many of you might be thinking, well, isn't that because the lifestyle is different for individuals who have experienced early life adversity, particularly from SES? Well, yes, uh, it, it is. Uh, another question might be, well, don't they differ in their access to healthcare? Couldn't it be that they just get different access to healthcare? That's why we see these problems cropping up. Yes, that's true. But there have been a number of studies that have been able to control this in a variety of ways. One of the most famous is done in Britain, where everybody had healthcare, uh, and where, we were, where the study, Michael Marmot did it, compared individuals who were at higher and lower levels of the civil service, uh, where there was not, you know, sort of occupational safety and health issues, uh, and, and where they had questionnaires to control for lifestyle, like smoking and diet and all that sort of stuff. And you still get that pattern that the earlier, that the early life adversity, in this case measured as early SES, has those downstream consequences. And by the way, you may be guessing. Uh, and you would be right if you have, that having those health problems means that you die younger. And yes, you do, right? The mortality rates vary by early life adversity in very significant ways. In fact, in the, uh, I'll talk about how it's different in different societies. It's about the worst it can be in the US. If you take in the US individuals who are advantaged on many of these socioeconomic indicators and being in the majority group uh, and, and the biologically stronger gender of women, if you are a, a white woman from high SES compared to uh, um, a um, low SES black male, your average life expectancy after childhood from 21, age 21 forward is about 16 years of your average expected life, 
right? You're going to have a 16-year differential in how long that you're going to live. Now, that's the maximum contrast, but, you know, it's about the difference uh, between average life expectancy in the West versus some of the sub-Saharan African, uh, sub countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a big, big difference. That's a population effect, right? So that's a big effect. So the point is, is that this is not just about how we feel. This is about a whole lot more um, than how we feel. Okay, so <clears throat> I've kind of said this already, but just to sum up, it has an impact on all kinds of outcomes in developmental health, right? All of them tend to show this physical health, educational achievement, your career trajectories, mental health conditions, as well as diagnosis differentials. For example, if you're, if you're a black male in a typical school system and you happen to um, uh, suffer with autism, if you happen to experience autism, your odds of getting misdiagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder are markedly higher, right? Uh, various other conditions are going to be differentially diagnosed depending on some of these things as well. Justice system involvement, which is an area that I also uh, work in, uh, dramatically different, right? Dramatically different by these, same, um, by these same indicators for all sorts of reasons that we know about, you know, mass incarceration of blacks and so forth and so on is pretty dramatic evidence. There are lots of ways that we could look at this, but they all point to the same outcomes in terms of SES as well as in terms of race and ethnicity. So it's basically everything that has to do with development and health, right? And it shows up as a lifelong burden in adult health as well as in child functioning and in mortality, as I just mentioned. Okay. So how, let's, we need to unpack this a little bit to try to understand something about what's the actual stuff that happens that leads to these uh, pretty pervasive and difficult outcomes. Well, one of the things we've already talked about is the effects are pervasive, right? It's not something that just happens to one system, right? So you could imagine a kind of analogy to say lead toxicity, such as uh, was experienced uh, very recently in Flint and the downstream consequences are, are plaguing us still. Um, that's likely to have some fairly specific kinds of effects, or at least ones that we know about that particularly, unfortunately, tend to be in uh, uh, neurotoxicity and brain toxicity, having to do with sort of cognitive uh, functioning and cap capabilities, as well as in the ability to self-regulate. Um, but they tend not necessarily to cut across the board, whereas this kind of early life stress, early life adversity does, and it affects all those different kinds of things. It's portable in the sense that even if you wind up in a much higher SES situation than you were born into, you're still very likely, probabilistically, to suffer some of these consequences even if you've changed your life status substantially. Right? It doesn't just go away, and it doesn't go away, as we'll talk about, because it gets into your biology. And the effects are lifelong, as we just talked about, okay? Now, what could account for this, right? That's the question that many of us have struggled with for many uh, uh, years, decades. Uh, how does this happen? We need to have something that allows us to understand how this kind of early adversity gets under our skin. It has to in order to have health effects, as well as learning effects, as well as emotional effects, as well as relationship effects. It has to be something right, that gets under our skin. So what do we know about that? So what we want to know is something about this getting under the skin part. How does it get from adversity into this biological status that then follows through in a variety of different ways? Right. So there are two major um, uh, um, ways. The first one we've studied for a longer time and know a little bit more about, although there's a massive amount still to understand. And a second one that's relatively newer that we're just getting a handle on now. The first is that we've come to understand that brains listen to the environment that they're, they're born into. The genetics lays down a basic blueprint, but there's a lot of latitude in how particular neural circuits get built, right? This is what's known as neural plasticity, and the mechanism of doing that actual thing, some people call it synaptic pruning, some people call it neural sculpting, but basically it's fine tuning that brain to the environment in which it finds itself, right? It has to be able to be adaptive to that situation. Now you can imagine, let's go back in evolution time, you can imagine that if you uh, experience high stress prenatally or in early life, that probably means that the environment you're going to be born into is a dangerous environment, right? If mom all of a sudden disappears from the scene, well, that's probably because something happened to mom and you'd better be expecting that. So it means that you'd, you're adapt 
your best adaptation in the fitting that environment is to be on high alert. It's to have a fast response system to anything that looks like a danger and be able to respond to that, right? Um, that happens most of dramatically in early life. Uh, talk about that a bit. Interestingly, though, adolescence is a second period. A lot of people, including me, tend to think of it as a second critical period of development for brain development, where, in fact, a whole new bunch of plasticity comes in, a whole new bunch of brain cells uh, known as synaptogenesis comes in, and we can, in fact, shape that in a variety of ways to overcome some of those earlier life adversity if that's been the experience up to that time. So it's not just one kick at the can to fit the environment. There are two kicks at the can. And if we can manage to deal with it in, in effectively later on, many, not necessarily all, of the problems can, in fact, um, uh, be addressed, right? Uh, now, of course, for many individuals, if they're born into a very dangerous, high-risk, low-resource environment, the odds are they're still going to be in that in adolescence. So, you know, it, it's, there's nothing magical there. You have to, in fact, uh, have something that goes on to be able to make that difference. The second area that we're now just starting to listen, about, uh, listen to, and, and it, you know, it's, uh, as I came to understand this and, and uh, found out about it a number of years ago from one of the pioneers in the field, Michael Meany, um, <laughs> talked to our group, uh, this was in Canada, and he, uh, he described this sort of early work on what's now become a burgeoning field of epigenetics, particularly social epigenetics. And epigenetics is complicated. The simplest thing is, it's the way that the genes listen to the environment that allows them to say, oh, okay, we need to fine tune, not change the DNA. You can't do that, but you can say, oh, these genes need to be turned off. These genes need to be turned on. The one I'm talking about, known as NR3C1, which is one of the important genes in the stress system, is what has a big effect on the feedback loop, right, to shut the system down after the stress event has uh, passed. That can be dramatically affected by the mom who's carrying a fetus being very stressed out during that period of time, substantially, not everyday hassles, but substantially stressed out, can cause that epigenetic change known as methylation to that particular gene which makes it function in a way that we think of as stress dysregulation in a normative environment. In a highly dangerous environment, it's pretty adaptive, right? Maybe you should run away at the drop of a hat or the rustle of a leaf, right? That's why, in a sense, we believe that it's there to be able to do that job. Or early in infancy, the same sort of thing. There's a high stress because parents are, the parenting, the nurturing is not available or is subpar for a variety of reasons can have the same kind of effect. Um, and it has the same kind of life course consequences. The other one that is, um, I think the evidence is starting to accumulate to a level that I think it's worth um, thinking as a, as a strong probability. I think the evidence is not totally wrapped up at this point, but there's some very good evidence in animal models particularly, because the generations cycle more quickly, that some of these changes, and this one in particular, some of these epigenetic changes can also be passed down to the next generation biologically the next generation can inherit that methylated version of that gene with the same consequences, even if their experience early on doesn't have that same level of stress, right? So it looks as though there's a good case to be made that, that indeed it can get passed down both ways. But it also can just get passed down if your uh, parenting is coming from an individual who's stress dysregulated, it's not going to help them be a good parent, right? They're going to get it wired up. You start crying as an infant, and they kind of like go ballistic, right? Well, that doesn't help you calm down, right? And so, and so that can be happened both at the behavioral level uh, as well as potentially at the biological uh, level. So this is all connected then to um, the one that I'm, I'm talking about here primarily is stress dysregulation, why we might have stress dysregulated systems. Okay. So the NR3C1 uh, um, is the uh, uh, particular uh, methylation of that is the one that can lead to the stress dysregulation as I've just talked about. All right, so now the question would be, well, how do we ever get away from this, right? <laughs> you would think that, well, if it can be bi behaviorally passed on or it could be biologically passed on, at some point, 
in one's ancestry, going back enough generations, has experienced something like this. How does it ever get it go away, right? So one of the things that's very interesting is to look at something that, that we, in, a, in one of our research groups, started talking about is kind of super nurturing an infant, right? And this was based on some work with, with, with animals, particularly with, with monkeys. You can't go directly from one to the other. And, and uh, um, uh, one of our colleagues, Steve Sumi, keeps pointing out to us, kept pointing out to us that we shouldn't anthropomorphize, but it's sometimes hard not to when you look at them. Nevertheless, um, what are the kinds of things that could reverse it, right? So we've already seen that the stress dysregulation can come from a high stress pregnancy, from epigenetic inheritance, from genetic vulnerability, which I haven't talked about, but you can have individuals who are just, who, who have a genetic variant that, that primes them for having dysregulated stress systems, or high stress early in infancy, right? And, um, but what we, what, 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 the Steve Sumi's uh, work and others have shown is that if you have sustained and persistent positive interaction can create resilience in the infant, okay? So what do we mean by that? Well, uh, there are challenges to doing this, right? Because let's, let's think about it. We've now got an infant for who, for whatever reason, is showing a stress dysregulated pattern. What's that look like in the infant? Well, it's an infant who's pretty easily stimulated to get distressed, right? And they're gonna show it by crying and screaming and fussing and not sleeping and so forth and so on. Okay, so every baby does that, right? All babies do that. For these babies, when they do that, all of the routines that we know how to run through that will bring them back down to a nice calm baseline aren't working, right? So we might pick, up, pick them up and, and cuddle them and, and, and you know, sway a little, right? A lot of times that's enough. They just kind of go back to sleep if they were sleeping and woke up screaming, right? If not, we all know the routine uh, when we're taking care of newborns or infants that we do. You know, are they hungry, right? Are they cold? Are they warm? Are they wet? Do they need a, a diaper change? You go through the whole list, right? I mean, as a parent, you hope that you hit on it before the whole routine has gone through. But nevertheless, you know these things are going on. But now imagine that you've got an infant. You go through the every bit of the repertoire that you've got doesn't help. They're still going like that. Well, what happens? Well, number one, you're going to be pretty darn frustrated as a parent, right? Here I am doing my best, right? And one of the great joys of, of uh, you know, along with all the challenges of, of parenting a newborn or an infant is that if it, when you hit on it, when you hit on whatever the magic thing was on that particular occasion and they calm down and they just kind of go into a nice state, Number one, you feel relief, right? But number two, there's a strong bond that's created there. You get an oxytocin release, a good, what's known as the trust hormone or the love hormone, right? You get this big burst of oxytocin, baby and parent, both, right? Get it, moms get it particularly boost when they're breastfeeding, but all parents get it when they get, or virtually all parents get it when they get this response, right? You've got a stress dysregulated infant, you're not getting it, right? All you're getting is more and more and more and more demanding. But if one can persist in being able to do this, there is evidence, and it's really more on genetic, vulner genetically vulnerable uh, infant macaques that Steve Sumi studied, what we find out is that indeed you get a reversal of some of those things if it occurs early enough if it occurs consistently enough, right? Um, but it, it's a tiny window. It's a relatively small window when that sort of thing uh, can happen. So when we're talking about humans as opposed to experimentally uh, raised uh, monkeys, um, what are the kinds of things? Well, you've got to get some help. You've got to get some respite. Nobody can do that 24-7 with a baby who's not getting soothed, right? So there are various kinds of ways that we need to think about it. Co-parenting, very frequently, a lot of this falls to the mom in our society, which still has those expectations. So dads have to step up, uh, or uh, in, in the other partner in, in non-heterosexual relationships, the other parent, both parents have to get involved uh, in trying to do this. Another mechanism is what's known as allo-parenting that um, Sarah Hurdy uh, coined some time ago, <clears throat> where it takes a village to raise a child. Well, here it takes a village to soothe an infant who's stress dysregulated. Uh, Others can come in, and so um, in the wild, and monkeys is typically female kin. But there are lots of people they don't have to be don't have to be related to provide that kind of support, right? 
Um, and then we need some programs, right? I mean, not everybody is in a situation to be able to benefit from these things. So various kinds of support programs that are aimed at parents to make things easier for them is a way to support the super nurturing uh, notion um, that can have a positive impact on that. That then leads to the issue of, okay, well, let's say we, let's say we missed the boat, right? We, did, we didn't manage to get it done. We've got, we're past the time where it's very likely we're gonna reverse that system, and we know that it has these uh, consequences. What are the kinds of things that are gonna make a difference in terms of resilience? The ability to bounce back from early adversity, the ability to, in fact, get around those various kinds of problems. And these are not necessarily, and so far as I know, there's no evidence that strongly suggests that you can reverse the HP PA access function. Some people are working on that, but it's a challenging um, uh, research proje project. But we know a variety of things that are very effective at mitigating, easing the problem, or working around the problem. And here are the, the, um, the big three um, that always come up, and for good reasons, there's very good evidence that they matter. The strongest effect that we've seen in any kind of research on this is having good social connections. Mm -hmm. Strong social connections, uh, and not just big networks of vaguely connected people, but actual, you know, intense, intimate, face-to-face -face kinds of relationships within extended family or close friendships, um, is the... Uh, it, is the biggest a positive impact, biggest resilience effect, right? Um, and partly, of course, that comes from support and nurturance. You're getting various things that reduce your stress load because you can share the load, so to speak, right? But also, it does have biological effects. It has biological counteragents. I already mentioned oxytocin. Serotonin, which is the target of a lot of antidepressant um, medications, is another one. In addition to having feel-good effects, uh, if you particularly have some of these difficulties, um, they also act as biological counteragents to cortisol, right? They, they, they take care of a bunch of the cortisol. So there's a very important value to this, right? But keep in mind, these are not magic bullets, right? It's harder for a stressed, dysregulated person to get into that kind of relationship because of the kinds of behaviors that they're likely to be showing. Fight responses come out a whole lot easier. Flight or social withdrawal, uh, internalizing kinds of things come much more readily. Another one that the evidence, I think, is still persuasive, despite a variety of uh, critical uh, studies that have said maybe it's not so uh, strong as we thought, but mindfulness-based stress reduction. That is where, in fact, we try, to we try to train up that part of our brain that enables us, uh, primarily a prefrontal cortex function, a higher cognitive order uh, functioning area of the brain, to, in a sense, keep us in the present to deal with the issues that we're looking at. We look to the past only for lessons to be learned. We don't do uh, regret, recrimination, resentment, and so forth and so on. Looking to the future, we do it productively for planning. Uh, exercising whatever control we have to try to control our stress situations, but that in effect, we're not looking to the future with great anxiety and worry and uncertainty and worrying about things that are not matured problems yet. We may have to deal with them or we may not. Spending our time on them is also uh, not productive. So the this focus on the present and dealing with the things in that way um, and there is the part of the work that's being the most challenged is whether observed brain changes. There's some evidence that suggests that there are. There's some folks that are saying, hold on, we don't have as good evidence as we should. Let's leave that out there. But some of the behavioral stuff looks like it holds up pretty well. Um, and then the, the th I said three. I've kind of not done the bullets right. F taking care of your body, right? A huge impact on stress, and particularly in adolescence, by the way. Um, but getting enough exercise, right? Fight or flight, it's called that for a reason. If you're fleeing, you're using your body, and that also uses cortisol. So there's a, stre there's a stre physiological stress regulation from engaging in regular exercise, right? Um, I guess I don't have it up here. Sleep. Sleep is a huge impact on how our stress system functions, right? That's the big adolescent one because typically they don't get enough sleep partly because they're spending a lot of time at night ruminating and going through the day and thinking bad thoughts about what happened and who dissed me today socially and so forth and so on. That keeps them awake. And then they're sleepy the next day. And there's some evidence that says when you have negative emotion thoughts going through your head as you fall asleep, those get encoded really well. And so the next day you wake up with them right at the tip of your mind, right, and ready to go thinking about them again. So sleep is another one. There are things to avoid, right? 
Among the things that counteract cortisol biologically, by the way, are the things that we call comfort food, and we call them comfort food for a reason, right? They, in fact, have that negative effect. I think we all know this, you know, sort of anecdotally in our own lives. If you're feeling super stressed out and agitated, distressed, overwhelmed, geez, you know, like a bowl of mac and cheese or a big donut, man, does that feel good? And it just kind of like, huh. I can deal with the world again, right? Now, the downstream consequence in terms of obesity and metabolic disorders is not to be uh, desired, but that's why they are so um, uh, connected, and some people would argue that they may as well also be addictive um, for, some of those, uh, for some of the same kinds of mechanisms that we're talking about there. Substance use has the same effect, right? Uh, or can have the same effect. Uh, alcohol, various kinds of psychoactive drugs relieve temporarily but create risks in terms of um, long-term uh, health risk outcomes, uh, risks for long-term health outcomes. So one of the points I want to make here is that we can deal with a stress situation, but there aren't magic bullets, right? One of the best ways to overcome the very negative effects of early adversity is arrange society so we don't have so damn much of it, right? If we didn't have so much of it, we wouldn't have that many people that are carrying the burden that we need to try to figure out how to make it work for them, because these are hard things to achieve, right? Anybody who's struggled um, you know, with, with uh, you know, physical self-care in terms of eating or working out or whatever, uh, or to try, mindfulness is not, you know, it's not like striking a pose and all of a sudden you're mindful. You have to work at it, right? Building social connections is something that you have to work at, right? These are not things that just come drop out of the heavens like manna, right? You have to work at these various things. Okay. Um, these are not, as I say, the, these tend to be in the area of mitigation and workarounds rather than changing the basic system. And so we need to find a way to interrupt the cycle at the start, right? Um, I've already kind of been through this in the interest of time. I'm going to skip over it. Uh, how, what is the consequences? You, well, I've already talked about them. You feel anxious, stressed, agitated, overwhelmed. It varies in how it expresses itself at different points in development. Um, it's associated with both externalizing, acting out, being angry, hair trigger anger, and internalizing social withdrawal, not wanting to interact because it's too threatening, uh, both in terms of symptomatology level, but also in terms of diagnosis. And it also affects learning and cognitive development because our ability to attend, uh, regulate our attention and emotion uh, is going to be impacted, and that makes learning pretty hard as well. Okay. The social equality, this is the thing I mentioned before, just so you see a picture of it. This is what this index, it's a, it's the, the numbers are in terms of a constructed factor, so they don't have a direct a numerical equivalent. But in the 70s, we had at low um, uh, SES, we had this level of uh, physiological indicators. This is base zero is the average between these. Z low SES had higher than the high SES, but it's a relatively shallower slope, right? The inequality is not as stark as up here. This is from, I think, 2010 data. Uh, oh, it's lumped together, 2009 to 2014. Look at this jump for the low SES individuals. And these are indicators that you're carrying a stress load physiologically, right? But it also went up for individuals at the high end of SES. It wasn't just the low end, and it wasn't just the middle, right? Okay. Um, so we've done some work looking at international comparisons. Um, and I, let me just, I'll just summarize this. I'm not going to go through it. How steep the inequality is in the society that you live in makes a difference. It makes a difference across the board for everything we've talked about. If you've got steep social inequality, so the individuals who are advantaged are very much advantaged compared to individuals who are disadvantaged and compared to people in the middle, these consequences flow very much more strongly than if there's milder differences. In terms of mortality, uh, just using some uh, National Academy of Science publication data, uh, just pulled it out for one point of comparison. If you want to live as long as the average Swede and you're in the US, you better be about the 70th percentile of SES, right? It's a big difference, right? And so how steep the inequality is uh, will make a difference, right? And here's a study that we did where this is looking at adolescent health and adolescent development and adolescent social engagement uh, in a variety of different ways. Uh, here we've got lower inequality and what we called high societal uh, resilience, right? Here we're hot, these are all well-off countries. If you go into, you know, sort of the third world countries or, or, or the um, global south as it's sometimes called, it's a different kind of situation. 
uh, where resources are a problem. But here, these are all wealthy countries, similar in wealth in a variety of ways, much more similar than compared to others. Okay, you may notice a pattern here, except for the Netherlands, which just snuck in over there for reasons I don't quite understand. Um, you know, data are data, they don't like, you know. Anyway, but every other one has some kind of uh, English language heritage. I know I'm Irish. People would say, hey, well, Ireland, you know, come on. But, you know, it was a colony, right? So was Australia. Well, so was Canada. Well, so was the United States. And so, in effect, what we've got over here, it's hard to avoid the inference that perhaps high inequality is a function of highly individualistic cultural traits that we, in effect, then indulge in to the extent that we are not very good at taking care of each other with strong social safety nets, with strong uh, ways to deal with various kinds of life threats that happen to everyone. And as a consequence, there are perhaps fewer stigmas attached to needing uh, some collective support from others in the terms of a social safety net. Okay. So why do they differ? Well, there are three big reasons why we see these things. One I've already talked about before is income inequality. Uh, oh. uh, if you measured income inequality in these, these countries, that was part of how we define resilience for sure. You're gonna see differences on income inequality in the direction you'd expect. Much lower income inequality and wealth inequality, oh, that's harder to study. Much higher income inequality and much higher wealth inequality, okay. Um, but beyond that, and you might say, well, that's, that's a pretty big political chore. We're going to all of a sudden convince the United States to redistribute income better? Not bloody likely. Well, no, we are redistributing, but in the wrong direction. We're redistributing up. Uh, and so that may be a heavy lift. But we could also think about making investments in human development. We could think about spending money that would, from very early on, like parental or even um, uh, you know, sort of expecting moms, creating a lot more flexibility for them in the workplace and a lot more support. Parents of young children, uh, that's where the problem is getting started in lots of cases. Even if we didn't do a huge amount of income redistribution, if we did something that would make it easier for those parents to not be so stressed and to be able to attend and nurture more strongly, well then maybe that would be something that we could do that's a human development investment. And then throughout early childhood, high quality early childhood programming, you know, uh, uh, improving education in a variety of ways, uh, various kinds of workplace supports, and so forth and so on. You can see how that whole package of investing in human development could break that cycle that we've been talking about, right? And one that that's, I love, but it's hard to get data, is what we can talk about as a collective imaginary, which I've just referenced in a sense. When we think of well, providing support to people, when we think of it as charity or giving to people, it's politically a loser, right? People don't want to take care of other people because we think it's the right thing to do. If we say, well, actually, you know, we should think of this as a right, and that's a difference between those high and low resilience countries. In many of those places, it's not, healthcare is not something that, oh, we should try to take care of people that don't have it. You've got a lifelong right to healthcare. Maybe we're trending in that direction, I hope so. You have a right to high quality early childhood education. That's not optional. You're supposed to have that. You have a citizen's right. When they tried to take it away in France a few years back, most massive demonstrations they've had in decades don't take away our maternelle écoles where we're gonna in fact take care of the youngest members of our society. And we need to think about that another way is to think about it. It's an investment versus a, a, a benefit that may be undeserved, right? So we're actually trying to improve what's going on for our population. That's another potential way um, to, to break that cycle. So there are others, I'm sure, but these are the three big categories that keep turning up. We have done some work comparing collective imaginaries in the US and Canada around healthcare. And even though Canada is in the lower group, they're doing better than us. And part of it is because they view healthcare as a right rather than as a privilege. Um, and so we can do various kinds of things that would, that would um, reduce these uh, effects by creating better circumstances that reduce the parental challenges to providing nurturing. Um, and I think that the, um, 
uh, and that we complete the cycle by saying, oh, there are lots of different ways that we could try to break that cycle. At every one of these arrows, there's something that we could do that would make a difference individually and societally that would reduce the stress cycle. At the moment, unfortunately, I think what we're seeing is this is accelerating. The vicious cycle is accelerating. It's not decelerating. It's not churning into a virtuous cycle. In fact, we're going stronger in the other direction. And given what we see in diseases, disorders, physiological stress loads, self-reports of being stressed out, that is a dangerous place to be. But the good news is that, in fact, we can do it that we need to put all hands on deck to try to deal with a variety of these issues, but it isn't hopeless. We could look at other societies at the moment and see that in fact, they are, they are, there are many societies are in fact doing this better. Okay, and so that's the end of what I was gonna talk about. Thank you.